Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to the Bet Like No One's Watching podcast. I'm John Sullivan. You may know me from my Twitter page, Buffalo Hold'em, or from my various other podcast and media appearances. Uh, it's good to be back. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday. Uh, we come to the end of November here. Uh, CFL is over for another season, and once again, uh, we had an outstanding Grey Cup game, uh, this time in the snow, as the Argos won in uh, dramatic fashion, beating Calgary. Uh, I should actually say the Stampeders lost for the second year in a row. Uh, I think they choked. Uh, some Definitely some questionable play calling and personnel usage uh, in the second half for the second year in a row. How do you not give Jerome Messam the ball in the fourth quarter in the red zone? Uh, you're up a score, under five minutes left. You're in the red zone. Uh, any score makes it a two-score game. Uh, you, you you give that ball to the Brampton bus and let him do the job. Uh, poor guy should have two gray cups. The last two years, Stamp should have won both games, and, and he doesn't have one. I feel bad for him. Um, uh, such is life. That's why we play the games, as they say. So I hedged my 15 to 1 Argos future and locked in a profit of 3.1 units on the final game of the season. I also had one wager on the under, and that also hit. So with a strong November. I came up with a plus 8.41 units on the season in CFL. Uh, that's five straight winning years of CFL football. Uh, very proud of that. Uh, yes, uh, it's a small market to the ballers, but as I've said before in my podcast, the lines are soft. And if you know a sport with soft lines, you should be betting it unless you hate money. So. Uh, I do enjoy watching the games. The product is, is light years better than the NFL as far as the on-field play. Um, the, ga the games are just more interesting. And uh, there's only four games a week you can watch every game. I've, I've gone on and on about this. But uh, uh, happy to do, uh, have another successful CFL year, and we'll do it again next year. So... It's strictly NFL for me until March. Uh, for those of you that don't listen often, uh, I, I'm only doing football, and I only do uh, Canadian football, National Football League, and Aussie rules. And the Aussie rules will start in the second half of March. So NFL, uh, my season uh, currently sits at plus 4.9 units. One game left in November. Thursday is the uh, Redskins and the Cowboys. I'm not sure if I'm going to play it. Uh, one thing I've noticed this year is that the totals are extremely low. Uh, I've had very few underplays this year, and the ones that I have, uh, for the most part, have come in. Uh, even the ones that missed were really close. So uh, the lines have been, you know, they've gotten a lot sharper. Um, there are certain numbers where, you know, it's almost automatically an underplay or automatically an overplay in both, in both NFL and CFL. And uh, they're starting to approach those numbers on the bottom side in the NFL. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens going forward. So uh, I wanted to spend uh, the crux of this episode talking about touts and the tout wars. And uh, I got a few interesting uh, comments to make about that. But before I get into touting, I want to spend a few minutes to talk about what's going on in the DFS world, some DFS happenings. Uh, uh, the first and foremost is Nigel Eccles, who's the uh, CEO of FanDuel, has left that position, and he says he's going to move on and work on a new esports venture. And this is very surprising to me uh, in, in some respects, in other respects, not so surprising. Uh, for example, it's been reported that his ownership in FanDuel is now no more than 3%. Uh, and that um, the, his combined, the three founders' combined ownership is less than 20%, and some somebody said it was less than 10%. Uh, 
uh, I, we have no way of verifying that. It's not a publicly held company. Um, but, you know, this company was valued over a billion dollars less than two years ago. And uh, he's just, you know, giving it up, basically. He has almost no ownership left. He's not uh, uh, taking any active financial or management role in the company. It's, it's very telling uh, as to what the future of that company may be. Uh, there's a lot to speculate on here in, in, uh, in what all the details are. But the bottom line is it doesn't look good for the future of DFS as a standalone product as you know is just a, a DFS operator site um, you know if you look over at DraftKings uh, they in the last year have been spending a lot of time and money developing its media platforms and Jason Robbins the CEO has said that they're, be, they're considering becoming a sports betting company um, not a surprise to me uh, I've said many, many times that I thought that these companies uh, would get into that market somehow. And I, I've also said that the value of these companies is in their user data, their, their members, uh, how much these people spend, where they located, how old they are, uh, those kind of things. And I feel like both of these companies will end up being either merger or acquired into a sports gaming company as soon as the PASPA issue resolves in the Supreme Court. Uh, and that's, you know, you could have a whole other podcast on the whole PASPA thing, but uh, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to a resolution, uh, a soft resolution by June next year. Uh, the Supreme Court will rule one way or the other, and then we'll know where uh, sports gaming in this country is headed after that. You know, it's sad to me in this whole thing that Robbins, Jason Robbins, is probably going to end up with more money and recognition than Nigel. Uh, but both of these guys basically buried companies that were valued over a billion, of $1 billion each. Uh, they refused to listen to good people, uh, my, myself included, uh, that really wanted the industry to thrive and grow and they uh, they were really, you know, very greedy, and and I believe that they felt that they could run billion dollar companies. They may have been the person, the people to grow those companies, but when they got to a certain size, I think it, the smart move would have been to um, bring in people experienced in companies that size. Even though their companies really do not employ that many people, uh, for whatever that's worth. Uh, there's a lot of bad actors in the DFS uh, game. And speaking of which, uh, Roto Grinders, the second item I want to talk about, Roto Grinders founder Cal Spears uh, won a Millie Maker on DraftKings. And, um, you know, I can't hate on him too much for doing that because he won the contest fair and square. And within the rules. But the rules suck. That's, you know, the bottom line is the rules suck. If you replace the, the phrase, Cal won the Millie Maker, with the phrase, an FSTA board member won the Millie Maker, it doesn't sound so great. This is a guy whose mission in life for two years was to convince these companies to do mass multi entry jackpots and you know that that uh, to build them up t to that point where uh, you know people could win a million dollars on a Sunday and lo and behold who's benefited the most from that the you know DraftKings and FanDuel are not doing that great Cal on the other hand he made a shit ton of affiliate money basically bankrolled his fantasy sports play and for lack you know in the nicest way possible he has access to high levels of insider information that most of us don't have access to not to mention a staff of really smart people 
to help him play fantasy sports. So certainly not a great look for the DFS industry. And it, you know, and it seems to be that nobody even cares. Nobody even cared that he did this. He, it, it's, it's painfully obvious to me that uh, uh, DFS is a walking dinosaur at this point. It's there, the, the handle is not up. The membership uh, active users is not up. Uh, the only way they can keep those numbers up is by going into new countries, which is getting harder and harder after UK and Germany. Where do you go? So, uh, congrats to Cal for winning the contest, but boo for uh, somebody from the FSTA winning the biggest prize in daily fantasy sports uh, that's currently available. So let's move on to the Tout Wars. Uh, let me start by saying that becoming a decent sports better, it's a long process. You know, when I started out, I sucked. Uh, I'm still trying to improve every day and, uh, you know, trying new things, <laughs> as FanDuel, as uh, DraftKings would say. But one big improvement for me was limiting my wagering to leagues I can follow because I have limited time and energy. And, you know, that's why weekly football works for me. I have, you know, a whole week to uh, consider the line movement, to look over the injuries, the coaching. Coaching matters. Kicking matters. And uh, that, that works for me. You know, having... 12 hours or 18 hours at max to make a decision on, you know, a large wager is, is not only stressful for me, but it, it's difficult for a lot of people, you know, unless you have the, uh, the tout bot 5,000 model, they can spit out an, an answer for you. Uh, anyway, uh, so having been through the process of, uh, being a shitty, lousy better and getting, um, getting better over time in the public eye. I respect when someone puts their their betting and their methodology out into the public. And uh, publishing accurate public records is something that very few people do. And, you know, it. I, I do, and it's, I'd be hard-pressed to think of 10 other people that make it very easy to look at, you know, your monthly record, your your last five years, your lifetime record uh, in a sport. And, you know, it, it especially on the Internet. The Internet's a mean place. And, you know, as a general rule, you're going to expect people to say unkind things. Uh, I You know, being on Twitter and being uh, public with my plays has definitely given me a tougher skin than uh, I had to, in the beginning. So when Rob Pizzola, uh, who is a tout that was involved with Odd Shark and Prediction Machine, and I think he's with Pinnacle now, a position with Pinnacle, but when he uh, he started some daily shit posting about uh, a, a fellow handicapper and making fun of his narratives, uh, which what you know, and that person is Sherwood, who's also known as SportsWagers.ca. And he started shitposting about him without naming him. And that's pretty gutless. It's a gutless thing to do. Um, you know, if you disagree with someone, you know, you just, you can comment directly to them. Um, you know, Rob doesn't post records. Uh, he does periscopes of his picks. And uh, he doesn't necessarily sell picks directly, but... He sold picks through his, you know, his touting vehicles, uh, prediction machine or whatever. Uh, now, you know, Rob can make fun of Sherwood, uh, not the right way to go about it. But, you know, if I w had to pick which one of those guys is probably a better handicapper, I might say Rob's a better handicapper. But I respect Sherwood way more for sharing his work and, and sharing his results with everybody. Uh, he... You know, he gets buried in some sports and he posts his records and, and that's hard, you know, that's honesty, that's accuracy. Uh, no, Almost nobody does it, you know. Uh, if you think the guy's bad and you don't want to acknowledge him, 
just fade him. Just fade his plays. You know, uh, but if you disagree with somebody's methodology or, or somebody's narrative or somebody's plays, you can just say, I disagree with this. Uh, you know, this is not, or this is not the right way to handicap, uh, you know, I, or, or I handicap a different way. I guess that's the better way to say it. I use different methodology and it's worked for me. That's what I would say, you know. Um, at any rate, I do my own handicapping. Uh, I, I try not to worry about what everybody else is doing. But at the same time, you can always learn something from others' insights. And the fact that Sherwood uh, shares his insights and shares his picks um, can give you, you know, you can look that over. I, I usually look when I post a CFL play to what he said about it, you know, and, and we don't agree often, but so what? It, you know, he's sharing his insights. I'm sharing my insights, and, and that's the way it goes. So that was that was kind of shitty, and I hope people treat each other nice, nicer, but I know that's wishful thinking. In other tout news, uh, Fantasy Labs has incorporated into uh, something called the Action Network, uh, which is going to be a new sports content platform, basically pods and videos and stuff. And uh, they also include Chad Millman, formerly of ESPN, and I think Sports Insights. I'm not sure if it's that one or some another, some other touting company, but. Basically, in reality, this is just Fantasy Labs, a DFS tout, transitioning into becoming a betting tout. Because, as I said before, DFS is a walking dinosaur, and these guys want to keep that uh, gravy train, if it is one, going. You know, or keep their, um, you know, their internet footprint or whatever notoriety. Maybe it's not always about the money, but. Uh, pretty soon they're not going to have anybody to play in DFS, so they're going to have to get into the uh, the betting wars. So uh, now I got one other tout issue to discuss, and that's we push the spectrum out from um, shitty touts to DFS touts down to uh, uh, Rufus Peabody and Jeff Ma, who are uh, very well-known folks and both have been involved with ESPN, and they have a podcast called bet the process and and rufus has been a professional better and involved with massey peabody which uh, generates you know uh lines based on data uh which i found very useful in the past and jeff ma of course was written about in the ben mesrick book uh, bringing down the house he was part of the mit blackjack team and doesn't seem that he's involved with that anymore but they are involved with uh, betting and this new podcast. And uh, on this podcast, they have a specific segment, which is called Tout or Sharp. And they discuss their opinions on specific in individuals in the sports betting community. Are they touts or are they a sharp sports better? Uh, I really respect these guys, and I think they're almost certainly smarter than I am. And if they did this segment to generate buzz and controversy, well, you know, mission accomplished amongst the people I follow on Twitter. Uh, yet their positions they take when they talk on this podcast, which makes me wonder if they're really in touch with sharp betters at all. Now, I'm not going to go and say I am actually a sharp better, but I, I will say I'm an experienced better and I'm a winning better. Um, so, Let's talk about Tout or Sharp and uh, this whole segment in general, because uh, basically the argument is very simple. You know, number one, Tout or Sharp should be if you sell picks, you're a Tout. And that should be the end of the segment, because anybody who sells picks is a Tout. And, you know, if they sell lineups for DFS, they're a Tout. And. You know, there shouldn't be any there shouldn't be any more discussion than that. Uh, so they it's like they, they created this segment just to give themselves an opportunity to talk to talk either great talk up somebody or talk shit about somebody. 
So I, 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 you know, it could be so much better than it is, is what, kind of what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, secondly, they pussyfoot around calling their former collaborators touts because they're friends or they're nice people. You know, I, I understand 99% of the people that are in sports betting media are in it to make money. I get it. They need to sell picks or they need to promote touts in order to make money and get paid for their content. But you can't, you know, you talk really, oh, this guy's a really good guy. I used to work with him. Even though he sells picks, you can't call an apple an orange just because you used to work with the apple. You know, it's, uh, you got to treat everybody the same if you're going to talk about if they're a tout or a shark. And Seville, Contrarianville, uh, regularly crushes these guys on Twitter for for trying to walk that line of we're sharp, but we're also tout friendly because, you know, obviously they want to open their self up to more media channels. And those media channels are involved with, you know, pick sellers and touts and whatnot. You know, I hope they wake up to that. Uh, it's. I don't know. I'm I'm critiquing this pod, but I like it. You know, and I certainly would love to be mentioned in this segment. I would love to be on it, to be honest with you. So if you ever somehow ever manage to listen to this, Jeff or Rufus, I would love to be on your, your podcast. Uh, but smart people are getting into sports betting media right now because it's going to happen next year. One way or another, whatever happens with this case, the uh, oral arguments are next week, and if they go in New Jersey's favor, there's going to be some uh, quick dealing probably in Congress and amongst the leagues and uh, states and gaming companies to get this done so people can – so there, there will be sports betting next football season. Uh, so hopefully things will move uh, very well for us here in the Northeast. Uh, so that's all I got for today. It's great to be back, and it's nice to have enough in the tank to crank out an episode. Uh, for those of you listening for the first time, you can catch all of my podcast episodes on my YouTube channel, Buffalo Hold'em, and you can also check out all my betting picks and my betting records on my Twitter page, Buffalo at Buffalo Hold'em, and whatever other nonsense I post on there. And uh, always glad to hear your comments. You want to leave them on my YouTube page or, or get at me on Twitter. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to listen and have a great holiday season and hopefully we'll be back soon so thanks for listening and until next time bet like no one's watching take care